Hey, Joda. Hello. Hi, I got a joke that's going to set up the context for this whole episode. So just imagine you're looking at a tree and the tree is filled with monkeys and all the monkeys at the top are looking down at all the monkeys below them on the tree and they see all these smiling faces and all the monkeys below at the bottom rungs of the tree are all looking up and all they see are a bunch of assholes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then like stuff starts dropping on their face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought there was a joke in there. <laughs> bananas, bananas start dropping on their face. It's <laughs> physical humor. Well, it's about hierarchies. It's about hierarchies of leadership and monkeys, which right, we're going to be right, talking yeah. about That's today. Right? Yeah, see. Uh, we're wait, talking wait. about chimp are, empire. Are you saying folks? chimps? Oh, wait, wait, wait. You're saying l are leaders have assholes? Is that what we're saying? Or leaders are assholes? I think it's a. I think it's both at the same <laughs> time. It's a Schrodinger. Schrodinger. <laughs> Depends on your perspective. <laughs> no, all leaders well, have Schrodingers Schrodinger. too. Are they long or short Schrodingers? <laughs> I, I guess it. I guess it depends on the situation know. and how excited they are. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, so, uh, <laughs> depends on the need of the community, what kind of Schrodinger they have. Well, I don't know where we're going here. Um, yeah, so, hey, everybody, welcome to Sense and Signal. Um, Dan just kicked us off with a remarkable joke uh, that, that I had to kind of be explained to me. But I, yes, uh, we, so Dan and I watched a show last week together um, uh, called, what was it called? Chimp, Chimp Empire. Chimp Empire. Chimp Empire. And it's good. It's good. And uh, we're, we're going to, we thought that might be interesting to kind of talk about uh, leadership and organizations through that lens a little bit. Now, we but by no means are we specialists in the chimp field, but we have, we are monkeys and uh, we do think that uh, we do have something <laughs> to gain from watching that show. And uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, Dan, I mean, what do you, what do you think of, and I think I think also well yeah. before we get to that the, what we thought of the show also there's also this theory called evolutionary leadership kind of an extension of evolutionary psychology um, that we can apply to to the show as well so there's some theory around this as well that we can apply to the behaviors of these chimps and their little tribal right, so organizations. I think that there, we actually one of us does have a little bit of knowledge on this so so you might actually get something informative oh. from this episode so let's let's see what happens you know so but let's 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 take a second maybe and talk about the show um well i i found it very interesting entertaining and extraordinarily well shot to the point that your wife was suspicious that it was even real. Yeah, no, it looked uh, very AI generated because of the, the resolution. It was just very, and you're like thinking, how could the camera get so close up to these chimpanzees? Um, yeah, so it was, yeah, but I, the, the show was compelling. You know, I was, uh, I was having a stressful weekend, was drinking some wine, so I fell asleep through a lot of it. But I still enjoyed what I watched in between my my wine naps. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. I'm trying to see right now. I'm trying to remember who who was the director of that episode or that show. It was only four episodes. Um, okay, okay. It was directed by so Chimp Empire was directed by James Reed, who also directed um, My Octopus Teacher. Did you watch that? Have you seen that? Oh, I heard about that. I did not see that, but I heard really great things about my octopus yeah, teacher me too. too. I, and how intelligent octopi yeah, are. Yeah. I, I mean, I I've I've always kind of known through various shows and books or articles I've read about the intelligence of octopi and and their 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 whimsicalness, I guess. Um, I, for whatever reason, I wasn't compelled to watch that show. I will now go back. I, I, Chimp, Chimp Empire is a great, it's good. It's four episodes. Um, it's an, about an hour each episode. It follows the life, but it follows the lives of two major tribes um, in the Angolo, I think Angolo forest. And they, um, and 
what it means to be a chimp and how to kind of live in that environment. Um, and we've seen things like this before to some degree, but like Dan said, somehow they got some shots in there. They, I think they were with them for about two and a half, three years. They just nestled, nestled up, nestled, mm. nestled themselves up, right? Cozy to the chimps. They basically get ignored because they're not chimps. And, uh, or so they say, and they just turn the camera on them. Uh, I think, and they had to be they had to be uh, aligned with some researchers too, right? I, I, that was my impression because they had historical context about the relationship relationships between uh, the chimps and the tribe uh, that went back many many years. So I think they were working with a group of researchers that have been observing the chimp tribes for yeah, quite they some did time. for sure. I'm, I'm sure they did. Yeah, and and that was kind of one of the issues you and I were watching, right? They so the 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 biggest beef i had with the series and again i enjoyed it I, we, we we benched it in four hours uh for the most part but uh what my biggest beef i yeah, now Dan, half, Dan half now half it. but <laughs> my biggest beef with it was that the the whoa my phone is talking my biggest beef was the personification i mean yes i i understand that chimps are very very much like us I mean, my, my biggest issue with the show was the personification of the chimps. Um, I'm sure we, we, I don't want to discount the ability for the researchers to kind of start to understand these chimps. Their emotional states are probably not unlike ours in a lot of ways, but they made statements like, oh, this monkey knows where all the trees are and everybody appreciates that. And it's like, how do they know that? They interviewed the guy? I feel like that's information you can only get from... Well, how do you know that about a human being? I mean, imagine if you there was a documentary film crew on Earth from another planet and the aliens were making presuppositions about our behaviors, right? I mean, how do you know humans are thinking what they're thinking? That you're, you know... Right, but with a human, you interview them. I mean, you talk to them and you can definitely... And we're very much intertwined with with our behaviors. We have we have connections with them. We, we, we can intuit things, um, which often come true, aren't... Well, there's a theory of right. mind. So there's a theory of mind that says, okay, this is another human being, so I can make some inferences about why they're behaving in a certain way. You're saying that theory of mind that we apply from human being to human being doesn't map. No, to I'm not human saying that at all. I could. I'm just saying that I think uh, obviously you can't interview a monkey. I mean, if I if I if I could talk to him, I'd go, "Hey, uh, uh, Jack, um, it looks like you know about the trees." Yeah, I, I know a lot about the trees in this, this place. Um, do, do other people know trees? You could observe. You could serve like Jack knowing demonstrating some knowledge about trees like and others within the group observing that too so they follow jack when jack says oh or maybe jack is just a leader but not the one who decides the tree is maybe someone else decides and jack is the one goes oh okay let's do that i'll go first you you just don't know (laughs) and that gets to the heart of uh evolutionary leadership because um mark van voot who is one of the leaders on evolutionary leadership would say that leadership among small tribe, uh, hunter and gatherer tribes or a chimpanzee groups um, would be all about initiative. Who takes the initiative first to do something? And that's a, a deeply ingrained trait. Like, like the first person to get hungry says, all right, I'm going to go out and get some food. Everyone else decides to follow. You know, that's, that is leadership in that context. So he's kind of defining leadership as a person who takes action first. The theory would. The initiative would initiative be part is, of the, is, that is theory. The person like, who, in the theory, all right, so you you have to view it through evo- the lens of evolution so that leadership and followership are adaptative adaptations that have some advantage for us as a species, especially as a social species. So take this group of chimpanzees or these tribes of chimpanzees in the forest um, or in the jungle there. They they are cooperating because it's to their advantage. The genes that they possess want to survive to get to the next generation. So they have um, figured out how to cooperate as a group to get the food and the resources and protect themselves from danger in order to survive. And the 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 
chimpanzees and the leadership roles um, are the ones that can help them achieve those biological ends. Yeah. No, and that, and that makes sense. And so let's 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 talk about that. Like, I mean, one of the reasons we want to kind of talk about the shows kind of was was from the leadership perspective. You know, what what the show highlights two specific leaders or qualifies them again can interview so we're not exactly sure that the specific relationship although it becomes a, it seems apparent that there are two leaders in the show and the names of these characters one was jackson and i think what was the other one? hutcherson leads the group yeah so jackson jackson yeah, led like the and dogo group in dogo when dogo and dogo and dogo central group which was the largest chimp community ever discovered it was actually larger than that until it broke off, splintered, and, and then you got the Western group, um, which was part of the larger central, but they, you know, got too big and, and, fra and, and fractured, and that was a smaller group, and that was led by Hutcherson, and you, so you kind of highlighted two leaders. The thing that was interesting that the show sort of highlights, again, I'm going to lean in that these people know what they're talking about. Um, Jackson... Um, was a big, powerful male that sort of led his big tribe, bigger group, through intimidation. He was that kind of classic, that that sort mm -hmm. of classic leader that we see in the chimp in the historical, some some other chimp documentaries you might have seen at times where he gets all, he just picks up a stick and runs around the forest saying, "I'm the boss, I'm the boss," and swinging the stick, scaring people, and then stops and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, he's like, I guess he's the boss. That's the boss. Yep, there's the boss." You know, so everybody's just kind of freaked out, and he does that every once in a while. Um, that's not to say that he doesn't have um, allies, and it's not to say he doesn't need allies. He has some allies. One of his allies, I think, um, uh, da, 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 was oh, what was his name? Not Milwaukee, but he has he does have some allies that he he leans in on, long term allies, and they're friends of his. Um, but he also has people who want to take his spot and aggressively. And then you had Hutcherson for the Western group, the leader, and they make a big point to say he leads his group differently. He doesn't do at least they alluded that if he does, he doesn't do it nearly as much. They did in the in the show, they he never they never demonstrated him doing it. Um, he doesn't do those those acts of strength and aggression. He they they explicitly stay say that he leads with a what like it, it's it more carrot egalitarian, egalitarian. But, because they make a point that the other males have power as well and are, have meaning much more meaning in that group like they everybody kind of carries their weight they have they they all get to kind of make decisions um and in fact it's, it's dispersed more it's dispersed, dispersed leadership, leadership model. model and in fact even the the balance the, they, they sort of they don't they don't say how it happened but they kind of i would say they alluded to the fact there was sort of a peaceful transfer of power because hutcherson was the alpha male in that again and when we say alpha it, like dispersed power though alpha male um a kinder alpha, alpha male um his brother was the alpha male before that and his brother was six seven years older than him missing a hand and his hand was an alpha male while i think missing a hand but my point being is his brother was still part of the tribe and also still very influential and also a, a sort of a confidant of his brothers so clearly there was a transfer power that had a, an, an elder, elder statesman. statesman yeah and so so it's interesting, you know, it's, uh, it's how much I don't know what to glean from that exactly for us from a leadership perspective, but it is interesting from a gym perspective. Well, okay, I, I no. do. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah, that speaks to this, this theory, too, because there's two theories around how observing chimp communities like that and even hunter and hunter and gather theories about hunter and gatherer tribes because we i think there are still some that you can observe around the world but you know it's obviously a, a population yeah. that's dying out so there's two theories one is that leadership is a byproduct of dominance and and submission right which would be i guess the the theory that jackson would um manifest right like you have the alpha male Ooh. <laughs> which you see me do every once in a while on the show yes. <laughs> i do all the time I, I get out of bed in the morning i walk in the kitchen hey, wife. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> 
<laughs> Bring me some bananas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so <laughs> you have you have the alpha male like he's coming around he's gonna dominate and uh and there's gonna be some natural submission because you don't want to get hurt by the alpha male and so uh that's one theory of how leadership uh evolved in our species but then there's another um theory that's counter to it which is that leadership is really about is born out of the need um to coordinate people to coordinate groups of people and it's more egalitarian and i think when you start to translate theories of how leadership evolved into the human species probably the coordination of groups of people of societies it really starts to make a lot more sense and i guess that would be the the other more egalitarian leader as the coordinator of the group okay so so the theory does bifurcate like two umbrellas essentially of leadership types and that well it's two right. possibilities right like people have proposed two possibilities to explain how does le how did leadership emerge in our species why why is it does it exist because from an evolutionary lens we've adapted right that within a population you're going to have some people who are going to rise to leaders and some people who are going to be followers and why does that happen why does our population distribute like that? There has to be some uh, evolutionary benefit for that yeah. to happen. And so, what are the causal? What are the forces shaping that behavior uh, within yeah. a group of people or a group? Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right, so let's. All right, so we are a sense making shows. What kind of takeaways from a leadership now perspective? Right, and my thinking is this: I've got a couple of thoughts. I want answers. Just, just sort of breaking it down not qualifying what kind of leadership is better right from these two from these two gentlemen uh, jackson and hutcherson um i got i know which environment i'd much rather work in um but there's but but yeah. one can argue um there might be value in both um and that's not to say again the value is outweighed by the the the, the deficits that might be introducing but i'm just saying there might be value in both but with Jackson, you know, he was able to very decisively take control. And, and I wonder if that kind of command that he had was a kind of command that he needed to 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 control such a large group. I wonder if if there is somehow uh, something that compels uh, that type of leadership when groups get larger to keep reining things back in. And if they and for the lack of for the lack of. Um, imagination they can't think of ways to keep that group and maybe as a leader at some point in time you actually have to acknowledge if you want to keep it a hutcherson's type of group you have to acknowledge that you have to let parts of your group go because you can own because you you relinquishing some control by the distributed model what are your thoughts around that yeah so i think there have been studies um about this this type of these types of leadership uh, behaviors amongst tribes, right? And so for the most part with humans, the, and I think you probably see it within the chip community too, the, the egalitarian type of leadership is pre preferential to the dominance type of leadership. And there actually have been studies that, that show that people within a tribe will try to um, disobey or you know push the dominant leader out if they're too authoritarian uh and that societies tend to you know galvanize around a more egalitarian leadership approach you know when i was thinking about this i, I kept thinking and this in terms of the, the documentary and the research around evolutionary leadership i kept going back to the epic of gilgamesh uh, because it's our earliest for our earliest text of from ancient civilization um, that we have, right? It's a Sumerian text. It's on clay tablets, and it's really a book about leadership. I mean, because Gilgamesh is a leader, and when you look at the beginning of that story, it is about him being a very authoritarian, dominant leader. He beats everybody up in his society. He cuckolds all the new husbands, and he has to sleep with the wives first before they can have them. And everyone, of course, does not like Gilgamesh. So they pray to the gods to send down Enkidu to come and beat his ass, basically, <laughs> which happens. And then they become lovers, I think, but that's a different story. But I 
think it's another indication, like even in those early societies, that dom- that what we think of as the big ape or big man theory of leadership um, does was not really welcome. They wanted more egalitarian leaders. They didn't want Gilgamesh beating everybody up and cuckolding them. Yeah. Um, but the fact <laughs> of the matter is, is that there are these leaders and what value is derived from having that kind of leader, right? There has to be some sort of value. It could just be for the leader, but it could also be for the people because you would assume at some point in time, if, if, if that value is outweighed by, by um, the, 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 the bad things that are occurring, they will get rid of them. A good example would be Caesar, right? There was a lot of value of having Caesar as an emperor. You know, and and but until but then the Senate said, you know what, that value is now outweighed by other things. We will kill him. And that happens. So that happened to Jackson, right? Jackson was a leader and there was value for them to some degree for certain people until these young upstarts, these younger people wanted to be in the position as well. And that makes me think about. So if you are a leader of that kind of position, if you are leading through. um uh, with a strong hand, um, with probably some close advisors, but you um, are sort of top-down, heavy decision-making processes, might be working for you as your business. Business, All right, I'm not going to make a judgment on that. You'll have to be a decider of that. But you do need to be aware that there's a really good chance, like Dan said, from a from a possibly evolutionary perspective, your, the, your employee's aren't appreciating it most likely, but maybe they are if you're succeeding. And that's the thing where if you are a single leader and you're, if you're succeeding, they do like you. And if you are failing, that's when they don't like you. And so you'll have to be succeeding more often than not. And as you start to not succeed, you will likely have people who will try to assassinate you (laughs) in one way or another, whether literally or just figuratively. And especially in today's world, symbolically, symbolically yeah. yeah. And today it's easier to do with, with YouTube. All I have to do is follow you around a little bit, and you're probably going to go to some place that you shouldn't have gotten, and then they'll put it on YouTube and your career is over with. So, Well, I want to I want to respond to two, <laughs> two pieces of what you just said, Joda. One is, I think it's important, like, when we're talking about, like, the chimp tribes or a hunter and gatherer <laughs> tribe, we're talking about small cellular communities, mm-hmm. right? Um groups of people when you start scaling that up to like multinational organizations you get a lot more complexity so some of the rules might not directly map but to your point though at the same time competence is key from an evolutionary psychology and a leadership point of view the way people become leaders within a group is that they're seen as competent right they bring Mm -hmm. value to the tribe, they know where the water's at. Can they I say know one where thing? the food's at. They know where the shelter. is the key word there, though, right? It doesn't have to be actual. Yeah. Perception is the key word there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everything's all about yeah, perception, yeah, yeah. right? Like, I perceive that this person is going to be competent at their yeah. job or competent in a, this leadership position for a group. And so I, I'm willing to be their follower because I want the resources that they're going to be able to provide me. Right. And I trust I, I have trust in them that they're going to have, they have some generosity and fairness when they distribute goods, you know, uh, or distribute resources. Uh, I think, you know, that's one really p- important thing about, you know, when you think about the, the evolutionary nature of leadership that we can't forget is that the leader's job is to help the group go out and get the resources they need to survive and then equitably distribute those resources so everybody has a potential to thrive yeah maybe Um, i'm gonna take a cynical look i'll take a cynical thought on that all right um definitely how dare you disagree no, just just uh, definitely (laughs) leadership one of the leadership's roles one is and i think it's proven out in chimp society as well um, is, is responsibility for protecting the group. But I think protecting is the operative word. Um, I think we've seen in. What's well, the protecting the group and risk yeah, resources look, are two different okay, things. Let me, right. Right. Because I think pro- there's a protection aspect of getting resources. But when I think of protecting, I think of threats, right. you know, and yeah, not having enough resources could be a threat, but I th- I'm thinking more of the other tribe. Right. Um, right. And, and one can argue that trumps resources, right? We've seen 
like when World War II happened in the United States of America and we went to World, we totally took resources away from us here. Like people said they couldn't, they, we weren't allowed to use lard anymore. And we had to eat, that's where we started eating canned foods because we started taking resources away from our tribe because we felt because of the action of protection. So I think protection trumps resources and and i think oh yeah and it will change it'll change to your question earlier about leadership i mean the studies that even within the evolutionary psychology realm and leadership realm have looked at images of different leaders one more masculinized and one more feminized um and show those to people within the context of different types of situations and when people are in a situation where they're threatened where there's wars on the table they're going to veer toward the more masculine looking image of the leader that they want whereas when it's a peacetime and things are tranquil they're going to look toward more more of a uh, the more feminine image and they even, even then that with trump right they have a feminized version of trump and a masculinized version and hillary clinton the same thing and it's consistent and it seems consistent across different cultures too it's not it's not based on just western culture and patriarchy it's it's deeply ingrained in us as well uh, from our evolutionary roots. And watching the show, when, according so to the when, theory. when the Jackson, Jackson being the more uh, heavy-handed leader, aggressive, dominant, classic alpha male, um, toxic masculinity guy um, uh, leader, when they went and got captured a colobus monkey, um, he comes back with it and he doesn't distribute to everybody. He leverages that as a tool mm -hmm. to create alliances. And they make a big point of how he, he clearly doesn't give it to this young rival that he perceives as a rival. And it, and it is a rival. Mm. And in the, in, this, in the story, he does rival him. Um, and he uses that as a tool, not clearly not distributing the food. Where, when we watch Hutcherson's group get a colobus monkey, Everybody gets food. Well, almost there. There's a there's a scene, uh, but but pretty much everybody gets act. No, no, everybody. No, sorry, everybody. They just have to. They have to come. Like I remember. Remember the brother who's missing a hand. He did. He didn't join in in the hunt. But once the monkey was or the the colobus was captured, they weren't dropping food down at him. But he did climb up a tree and join it and got meat. They're like, oh, you're here. Here's some meat. Um, mm -hmm. So again, I'm wondering if there's a function of size, and I'm wondering if there's a function of like you said this eminent danger because i'm wondering if jackson being the central group and the dominant group if they feel that they're always in threat of being encroached upon so you have that sort of strong man leader because you feel like you're in a constant state of readiness and per, per potential war where are the ex on the, the, the smaller tribes they're just on the outskirts and it's up to them if they want to kind of encroach upon the bigger space or not so they are they don't feel that 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 defensive need to fight all the time and it's up to them to be offensive and they're not necessarily as warring. So it allows for a Hutcherson type of personality goes back to that. We talk about what is that critical, um, the decision-making process where if you're, if you're a, if you're in a, if you're in a war situation, you're not going to sit back and have a, have a, uh, a committee make decisions on the ground, right? You are going to have to have a strong leader right. to make those decisions. And so I'm wondering if the, the nature of Jackson's tribe versus Hutcherson's tribe actually created an emergent type of leader. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting theory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and part of it is safety, right? And so the 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 leader in those tri in, in that group and and other groups uh, is supposed to part of the coordination of the group is about providing safety to the group. And we have the incident of pork pie, who is I think is an exemplar of this situation where pork pie goes out on, on his own uh, to get some food, doesn't have the rest of the group around him, and gets <laughs> murdered by the other yeah. tribe. And so that's just an example of why that collective group is really important to their survival. And, and that's part of the leader's job to make sure that that group is coordinated. I guess that this distribution of food is a way of coordinating that group. And by saying, oh, you get some and you don't is also a way of uh, providing status 
two different members of the group to um, leverage. And I've seen as well. that. I've seen that in business, you know, and again, I tip, I'm not going to sit here and say, I, I have my opinions on what makes what the kind of leadership is best for the happiness of, of people. Um, as a, That's my metric. I don't think the, the chimps care about happiness. I don't know. They probably do. Whoa, chimps want to be happy second. I got to plug my computer and I'm going to lose you. Hold on. <laughs> that was close. All right. And scene. Go. Continue. Chimps and happiness. Chimps. <laughs> the chimps really want to be happy. I'm sure chimps do want to be happy. If I were a chimp, I'd want to be happy. So, yeah. So they're probably going to g- uh, gravitate to the leader that they think is going to bring the most happiness to them, whether it's through resources, providing resources, providing protection, um, giving them a baby. <laughs> well, I didn't want a baby from my leader, but yeah, maybe perhaps a baby. <laughs> Some yeah, people do. It's true. Some people it's do. True. I think that there is, you know, again, from you, depending on how one wants to establish success for the organization, and I'm talking about when I say some people, I mean some chips right, do. Right. right. They want the good yeah. genes to go under no, the right. I think it's even untrue in the organization. Um the uh, <laughs> well the uh, depending on how you judge how you want to judge the organization, you know, if you're looking for pure bottom line dollars and productivity, um there's probably plenty of examples of strong person leadership winning those. I'm sure there's plenty of examples the other way around too. Um, I think you'd probably find less happiness in those organizations with those those types of leaders. But I could be wrong as there as well as sure. I'm not sure, but but I think if you are that kind of leader, you are going to have to be prepared for people to be aggressive um, and looking to take you down at some point in time, most likely because you're leading through fear as opposed to respect. Where with like Hutcher, with Hutcherson, right. he didn't have to worry about that. Again, that's just, again, I'm going off of the, with the show, so I don't know if that's totally true. But Hutcherson, he didn't have to worry about that. His team loved him. Um, everybody felt respected. They felt like they had equal parts and decision making and had their special magic powers to get certain things done. Like that one, that one we talked about who could find the trees. He was a 44 year old male chimp, which is old for a chimp. And he still had value for the, for them because they saw him as wise. He knew the the lay of the land. He was the one who, as Dan said, took him to the the, the, the points of trees, you know, um, where the trees were. Do you think the leaders? Do you think the leaders like Hutchinson and Jackson had strong social intelligence skills? I think yes, because that's one of the key things that that I think Chimp um, research has shown is that communication is absolutely paramount for them. And as we've watched, right, again, I, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to imagine how much, how distinct the co- communication is, like what they glean, what they learn from each other through these processes, because they don't have a language like we do. But we, watching the show, you know, when we've seen it a thousand times, grooming, physical contact, eye contact, that is all paramount to them engaging, trusting each other, understanding each other, communicating to each other. In fact, um, I was reading one article about that there is c- certain ch- chimps do uh, rise to the top and become alpha because of their ability to communicate ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that, that would fall in line with the evolutionary theory of leadership, too, that that strong social intelligence would be key uh, to to being able to get groups to cooperate and yep. coordinate groups for their survival. Yep. And that those those people or those chimps in this case who uh, rise to that level would have a higher level of social intelligence. Yeah. yeah, no, it's true, and I think, and that's also something interesting. I think we again, from a sense making perspective, it's not always we're st- if if one were to agree with the theory that we are derived from a similar ancestor, um, and that we are technically hairless apes. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the studies suggest. In fact, some a lot of the team research I've done recently suggests that really we connect on the chimp level, mostly not in any other level, like the, some team research I've just read, I've been reading uh, recently. I think we actually did a show on her. If we have, we will, I can't, 
We did do a show That's, on it. We did do. Yeah, we forgot about We've that done show so many. already. We've done so many. But, but it basically suggests that that I dreamt that teams. show. I, I sometimes I have dreams. I'm like, did I dream we did a sense of signal? It's podcast? true. I, we, yes, yes, yes. We got we got a lot behind us. Um, but it, the idea around it was that that you could tell the success of a team by not what they communicate, but how they communicated. You know, the, the nature of the communication, not yeah. the, the, the energy, energy the, the, the engagement. They would talk about, how, you know, everybody gave everybody enough time to talk. No one spoke over each other. They looked at each other in the eye. There's a lot of eye contact. If you watch that show, it's pretty amazing. There's, there's, there's a couple amazing shots in that show where they're just looking at each other. You're just, you almost come to tears because you could just tell there's love or respect in that look. They're just, it's almost, that's why we, we when you're watching, you're like, is this real? This looks like this is a Disney 3D thing. This, they, is this how they actually engage each other? So see, you're applying a theory of, mind to those apes right there right you're saying not apes but chimps they're ape by their look right you're saying like there's some intelligence there's some empathy happening behind those eyes yeah no that's clear it's it's obvious they they love each other you know and 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 you that's because you're related we are related you can tell (laughs) that's that's true my uncle still lives there so so (laughs) <laughs> so does mine bob my uncle bob so <laughs> we'll both get a couple uh uh chest slaps and before the end of the show um you know when we talk about this i can't help but thinking about you know society scaling up right because what we're looking at there is probably the genesis examples of the genesis <laughs> of leadership behaviors in human beings and now we've scaled up to this very complex world with very complex systems and organizational systems and so forth. But still, I think deeply rooted in us is are those core instincts around leadership and what we look for in leaders. And I can't help but think about, you know, our current president, the upcoming presidential race that's happening. I was watching a... Um, the all in podcast recently well yeah yesterday actually and they had robert uh, uh, f kennedy jr on um and he's running for president and he's uh, bobby kennedy's son so bobby kennedy was assassinated when he was running for president in the 1960s and i was watching him speak and i'm just like we have this phenomenon in the united states where we have these really old men running for president we got you know, Biden, we've got Trump now. And then we got Robert F. Kennedy Jr. 69. Looks like he might be, you know, could pass for 70 or 80 himself, you know? And I'm just like, what is that? Was that something that's hardwired into us? Because we've had younger presidents like Obama and Kennedy. um, But we tend to gravitate toward these older men. I, I just can't, sometimes I really struggle with it. Like, like, at some point, you know, your hand's been chopped <laughs> off like that ape, and you need to step aside and let somebody else take that leadership position who's a little more younger and energetic and not to be ageist, but still, I mean, I can't help but wonder about that. I don't feel like... Do you think there's anything that these chips... Yeah, I I, I don't... Well, first off, I, I, I don't think I see that in, the org- in organizations outside of politics. Um, I mean, I feel right. CEO, I, I, I mean, let me, let me just do a quick search here. What is, what is the average age of a CEO? And the average age is 51 years old. So that seems like a legitimate age for a leader at that level, 51, you know? So I, I, I think I guess kind of, I, I, I push back on your premise. I think there's some other dynamic that's forcing us to, as far as the politics is concerned, to to, to vote on these very aged men. Um, there's something else forcing. I don't think it's our natural propensity to want to have 80 year old men running stuff. Um, I think as elder statesmen, not unlike Hutcherson's brother, who I think Hutcherson was, I think was 30, 29, and I think his brother was 36 or 37 or something like that. <clears throat> But um, but I I, I don't I I don't think so. I don't think there's anything. I think there's another dynamic that's making that happen. 
Yeah, I, I, maybe. I mean, I, I'd be interested to see if there is an age factor. I mean, because when you're talking about an organization, that's one thing. We're talking about a societal leader, right? And when you're talking about a president or a governor, mayor yeah, of a that's city, been a, that's been a you know, recent, it's a different dynamic. What is the average age of a president? I, th- I think it's been a recent thing. F- well, we've been living 55 longer, too. is the average age of a president, you know? Yeah, but that's because people used to die super young, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, I mean, you were lucky to make Bill it to Clinton, 60. Bill Clinton was 45. Uh, Obama okay, yeah, was Bill 49. Clinton, Bush was 48. Um, uh, Reagan was an old. Bush was 48? Like that. Yeah, I think Reagan. Not HW. HW was older. Well, a little bit older. I think he was in his sixties. That was still a reasonable age. Reagan was the was it was the freakazoid. Um, I think uh, Carter was what? How old was Carter? Although Reagan was younger than Ob- than Biden right. is now. Right. Let me see. How 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 old was Carter when he was elected? So. Th- oh, he was probably in his forties. You're probably right. Uh, Fifty two. He was 52. So he still went. So it, this is a recent thing. This is, this is not, this is, that's not. I don't wonder. Maybe it's just that people are living longer. So maybe that's uh, Carter's part of the 92. Factor. Right. Um, that Carter's still alive. Reagan died at 90, something like that. Well, he's in, he's in some, I don't know. I, I, again, I, I think I'd push back on your thinking that there's something about wanting 90 year old people to lead your company. I, I, I don't see, I don't see <laughs> I'm not saying there's something. I'm not saying one thing because clearly I don't want that. You know, I'd like I'd like to see somebody younger in those positions, yeah. but somebody who has to live with the consequences of the decisions make, being made. If you're going to get walk out of office and drop dead, what do you care what you yeah, decide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let me let's all right, let's let's flip to a bit of an organizational concept here. So, the show, you know, again, not speaking about the leaders, but the the the, the other chumps in the in the system. Um, watching the show what did how did hierarchies play into this did you see like like strong hierarchies in it did it look from what from what you gathered was it a flat or at least were they flat organizations these chimp structures what did it look like to you yeah i do think uh there are definitely there's hierarchies in the chimp structure right the chimp organizational trunk structure of their tribes um yeah so that's deep, deeply embedded because you definitely have the alpha male or the alpha um chimp who's kind of in charge of everything uh and has their own leadership approach clearly between hutchinson and jackson but um yeah there's the, and then there's you know allies you know you might want to see see those allies as lieutenants um so there's definitely a strata of uh influence that happens within the the chimp communities yeah uh, the way that you know the young, some of the younger chips when they started getting older in their teens, they start to kind of flex their muscles, um, kind of showing other people like, you know, I'm to be contended with. Here I am, and if they did it too much or did it in a way that pissed off one of the other older males, the older male would come down and <laughs> smack them down. You know, um, give them a good whooping, hurting. You know. As you should. Yeah, exactly. As you yes, should. Yes, yes. <laughs> I see again, I see Dan do it regularly to Gen Z. All the yeah. time. Just All the time. Them. Oh, Gen Z. <laughs> Watch out, you the upstarts. Other- but clearly, I mean, at the end of the series, one one tribe seemed to be more successful. Would you say that's true? No. Was there success not at the really. end? I, I mean, mean, so what where did it leave I, off? I think where Dan is, is alluding that again, just to kind of quickly summarize the theme, the Western tribe, the smaller tribe that broke off, led by Hutcherson, they were encroaching upon the bigger tribes group because of these trees, I think is resources. And that's something I actually want to bring up also real quick. And the idea is that they had all these resources. And and for, it was was interesting is that the edges of their boundaries were always at these key eating points, which is interesting. So the question would be asked, is it coincidence that the key eating points are the boundaries or is it that the 
key ending points are the boundaries. And so that gets translated into us when we are starting making decisions for organizations where we've defined our boundaries. Are we defining our boundaries or are we letting the, 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 the sort of resources that we think are out there defining our boundaries? Important thing to think about as you're a leader mm, is to think, you know, how much am I being driven by what I think is important versus what actually is important? Because maybe the chimps could have gone someplace else because all their boundaries were, at least the way the show made it sound like, was really were around these key trees. Like, and it just so happens these trees are right where the no man's land is. So like, is it just so happens or is it by definition that's where the no man's lands will be? So something to think about as you're an organizational leader. It's like, how am I, am I being? And how would you translate that to a, um, a, 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 I get the context within that chip community, right? Why? Why the the fruit trees would be boundary sure. markers uh, because it's a, a vital resource. How how do you map that to an organization today? What's that tree with oh, the a market? That fruit tree like, look are like you letting to, them? Are you letting the okay. environment define your market? Or are you because if you let the environment define your market, oftentimes then that means you're going to go toe to toe with other people. But if you actually redefine your market, and it's proven time and time again, you're the first one in there, and you and, and it proves to be true. You're not fighting anybody. There's no one to fight. You know, remember, like, it's kind of like mm. the Ugg thing with, with, with Brian, right? When he came in initially, there was no one to fight for Ugg. He was just fighting against himself. Later on, that wasn't true. But there was, you know, there was a brand new market. You know, he was not going to toe to toe with anybody. No pun intended. Well, he had to sell the value. Right, no, right? no, that's what brand, you have to do. The, the, you have the, to, the, the, yeah, that, yeah, I'm not saying there isn't problematic problems in there. I'm just saying, as an example, right? You, are you letting, are you defining, are you letting the market define your actions? Or maybe are you going to be defining the market? Right. So I would say that would be your tree, which are you defining the tree or the trees? Defi- are the trees defining you? Right. So something I thought that was. Yeah, no, I'm going to I'm going to map. I'm going to map it over to a different thing from higher education because we just went through an accreditation process. And one of the questions that kept coming up is, is the budget driving your decisions or are your decisions driving the right. budget? Right. You know, are you making decisions just because oh, this is the only resources we have, so we have to flail around and do this and that with what limited resources we have versus do we have a strategic plan going forward and are we allocating our resources to achieve that That's strategic right. plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I know I thought that was interesting because if if they were to think of new markets, they were just always fighting over these damn trees, you know? So going back to your point about was there a winner, um, the Western group was constantly approaching, uh, encroaching upon the, the North, the central group to get more land. And so the show ends with in th- basically them saying, yes, the Western group inevitably expanded their territory and the, and the central group lost some territory and, uh, spoiler alert, Jackson dies. Um, so they're out without their leader. Um, and they've lost some territory. So, and again, Jackson is the authoritarian. He's the authoritarian leader, right? And, and he so, dies basically by fighting. Uh, essentially, war is what kills him. <laughs> so you, as your authoritarian leader, yeah, you, know, you yeah. might, you, you know, you might enjoy. A, I, I have a feeling that's another thing: is authoritarian leaders and organizations probably have short-lived tenure in their environment. But I don't know if that's sure or not. Oh, for sure, for you know, sure. Um, it might be effective, but someone's probably going to probably try to take over. At some point in time, I, again, I, I don't, I don't have any numbers on that. Or people, I mean, people leave the organization. There's, there's, you know, and you know, even in the research from some uh, ethnographers who've, you know, observed hunter and gatherer tribes under authoritarian leaders, people even commit suicide and kill themselves yeah. just to get out of that kind of control. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you lose, you lose social, social power. Power's a good one. Yeah. If, if leadership from an evolution, if evolutionary leadership would teach us anything, that one of the, if it's true that what leadership has evolved to be is the process of coordinating groups to work together to achieve some sort of end for that's mutually beneficial for everybody in yep. the tribe or in the group, then um, then if you have somebody in the leadership position who's doing damage because they're authoritarian and harming people. They're going to overthrow you at some point. Uh, they're going to get rid of you. Let somehow. me let me throw a wrench in that because again, going thinking that the dynamic might be a little different, and this might be be a, a problem that you know one of uh, an issue that we've never really reconciled, um, and we're probably coming it's probably coming to a front right now, and that is as a CEO, actually in theory, 
you're if you're a CEO of a company that's on the stock market, you're beholden to the stockholders. Your your all your energies are about making your stockholders happy. Their your alignment is to make them happy. And mm -hmm. if you're and only if you're if you perceive having your if you under if you think you understand or perceive having your workers be happy if it helps with that will that come true if it is neither here nor there or you think the opposite then that will come true right for them because their goal is as you see so there's a misalignment there um do you think there's something did you see something like that in the tribes of the chimps i mean do it seems like there's more of a direct relationship to yes the leader and and the other chimps where with us we've kind of disassociated the value sort of because i i don't know i it, it, i think it's complicated but what are your thoughts yeah no it is complex cuz i well <laughs> We've evolved, we've changed, right? Our society has changed, though we know biological evolution happens at a much so, a slower pace than yeah. culture, right? Cul culture is probably an adaptation that we have created to address the fact that we are slow, slow, much slower at evolving biologically, yeah. right? But we can create societies and cultures that can s accelerate. Um, because our technology's uh, evolution is accelerating as well, and we need to be able to make adaptations to to address that, as we're seeing with ChatGPT and AI now. Um, and so our concept of leadership is changing too, right? So it, that's why it makes it hard to truly map what's going on with a group of chimps to what's going on in a CEO boardroom. Because although at the same time, and both two things can be true at the same time, we're still influenced by our our evolutionary yeah. roots so there are things we can learn but at the same time we have to recognize that we're operating in a much more complex multifaceted environment when we're talking about corporations or colleges or businesses or government agencies and um leadership tends not to be focused on one person as we've discussed with like Dan yeah. Eds, right? It's more a leadership then becomes a system. Um, and, you know, I guess even in thinking about um, evolutionary psychology and leadership, you know, you, you, we still form, even within organizations, we still form little tribes, mm -hmm. right? Like you might, uh, you might call them teams in your organization or departments or units, uh, but they act as a little tribe that are contributing and they're doing one function that's contributing to the whole, you know? So when you're at the top level, you're actually managing all these little tribes on, in some sense, but those little and maybe on the, those little smaller tribes within the organization are behaving more like that trip ship yeah. tribe. <laughs> yeah, no, I would agree. That's what I, the as forest, you were talking, you know what, I mean? what I was kind of thinking was like it might map more to the smaller team level siloing, siloing, siloing right? Wanting to shine, S competition for stealing, resources, stealing talent, uh, cross getting yep. you know uh, uh, also, but at the same time trying to get DNA crossed with each other. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I think within an organization, I think that's why you have to. And I, I come from a college, a high, higher ed background. Where we definitely have those tribes, right? We even use the term tribalism a lot within organizational leadership or tribal knowledge because we, even we know say the term groups. tribal knowledge you know i use it all the time tribal knowledge yeah, yeah. because they we you know we do we have these tribalistic tendencies when we get into yeah. groups and we have like some commonality around our group and resources is a, a, a big part of what creates conflict like why is that group getting resources and our group's yeah. not, you know? And if our leader is not helping us get resources, the resources we think our group needs, then that leader's a failure. Yeah. I will so, and we're going to go after that So a that good leader. lesson for a leader who is managing a bunch of tribes is to make sure that your tribes or your teams have enough resources. Otherwise, it's going to be a bloodbath. So you got to do that. Well, I've, yeah, no, it could, it could be the Hunger Games. I, I've seen, so depending on, this is where I think executive leadership has really a lot of influence and power. Like, so I think that's where the complexity comes in. Like when you're at the top, upper level, 
you are on the balcony, as they say, as Heifetz would say in adaptive leadership, and you're able to see all the different players on the dance floor below or all the different tribes interacting with each other. And so you need to be cognizant of the political plays that they're playing between each other and not get sucked down into it. Don't get sucked down into their drama uh, because then you're, you're just going to get in the, involved in the maelstrom. So you've got to keep that distance. And it's a different perspective of leadership than when you're leading a small tribe, right, of people. Like if you're leading a department or something, I would think. And you want to make sure, but you want to make sure all those tribal elders are cooperating together too, right? Like all, all the different department heads. Because if the department heads are, are, are in a situation where you're saying there's not enough resources to go around, fight for it. And, and then that's what I've they're going to do. And it's going to no, be I've a bloodbath. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it too. Yeah. So I think a good leader at the executive level recognizes that and makes it very clear to those department heads or tribal leaders, for lack of a better word, like, no, we have a common vision and a common goal we're trying to get the whole organization to. So you need to cooperate amongst each other in how you distribute resources. It's not going to be acceptable for you to uh, fight for what easier we have, said than you know. do than, than done but we will definitely touch base on that in further episodes dan um i hate to say this but we are at time are there any final thoughts anything that's been left on the floor that you want to kind of say within the next 30 seconds to a minute before we wrap this show up no i have i have dispensed all the wisdom i have to dispense for the week okay. Joda. i hope everyone eats it up like a Bushel bananas. of bananas. So I was going to actually start the show with a banana, but I forgot too early in the morning. I thought about yeah. it too. I was going to do like an ASMR kind of like. <laughs> That's like, what we should have done. Actually, we can go back and edit and bring that in. That's probably what we should do. Oh, you know what? Let's end yeah, it. Let's, we should, we should let's done. end it that way. Let's end it that way. So we'll just be eating a banana. So, um, okay. Well, hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining the Sense and Signal. Thanks for listening to us rant about chimps in leadership. I hope that was some interesting conversation for you all. What do you think, Dan? Are we out of here? Oh, su uh, subscribe. Subscribe. See later. What's see all should we say? Uh, subscribe, like, send us a banana. Send us a banana. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll see you up in the trees, see you later, folks. Guys. Canopy. Yeah. Bye.